Hello, folks. Hi, Erin. Angela Faring, how are you? I am well. How are you today? Good, good. Evidently, I have a canvas issue. Uh, yeah, are you not getting in still? I resent the invite to you just a little bit ago. Nope. Um, no. Yeah, I just wrote you back. I waited 10 minutes. I never got an invite in the first place. Hmm. Because you're you're listed in my canvas and I'm new to canvas, so forgive me. Um, and uh, so we had an administrator set those up and I see you're in there as pending. So maybe it's getting hung up in your spam filter. I looked. Uh, um, I wonder what it who is be. it from? Who sent it to me? Uh, it would have been from canvas um directly like from the published course and again i'm new to canvas so we'll, we'll troubleshoot this somehow um maybe the only other thing i'm thinking is that your your email is in all caps maybe that's making a difference i don't know yeah i'm not sure the only email i have from canvas is from something i did in 2020 well here maybe if you try well you've already tried going to the course and it's not giving you access so i was a late addition i know that i was on the waiting list and i got in late okay i i don't know if that well that's helpful anything. because maybe because i added you then myself which might be different than how everybody else was added so let me uh write the administrator who added the folks to begin with and see if they can do something to help um okay but i'll have to deal with that probably like right after the session that's fine that's fine okay. i just wanted to uh let you know that i'm like yeah, huh. no turns worries. out we had a homework the week before yeah it's okay. so yeah it's okay you can catch up it's not a big deal it was just introductions and um a discussion that we'll have in class today so yeah, and it looked like you're doing some backward design stuff, which I'm very familiar with. So yeah, I think. But I'll maybe you have something cooler than me, and I'll steal your resource because I love stealing resources. <laughs> um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you love resources, I'll have to uh, give you access to. I have a bibliography, a learning engineering bibliography that I uh, curated, and um, that's always of interest to folks. I should actually bring that up because that might be helpful. Oh yeah, that sounds great. So I teach a master's level instructional design course in an adult ed program. Oh. And they take one, 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 one. So it's a, it's a little too intense. Like the course is, just, it's too much, right? Yeah. To, to only take one. So um, I'm working on, um, quality not quantity as far as what I what I use with them mm -hmm. and I use a lot of Wiggins and Matigue I'm an old social studies teacher and backward designs like came from social those guys were social studies mm -hmm. guys back in the day so I use that a lot um and I'm always interested to see what I can do that will help them help them learn more practice more do more yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah, we we designed this, um, you know, for instructional designers. So we're not like reteaching you things that you already know. I'm hoping to just um, add some skills and access to tools that you might not have had before. And... Yeah, I'm super, super excited. Um, I'm a professor that's an instructional designer by design. <laughs> so I'm, I'm learning this stuff is all you know, intentional growth in this area for the last eight or 10 years. So I'm really excited about this program. Thanks. And we'll see. It's the first of its kind that I've put together. So we'll see. It's modeled after our Learn Lab summer school, which is like a week long intense thing um, and geared to like everyone. Whereas this is more like we assume you already know how to do basic instructional design. We're not teaching you backwards design. Like you probably already know that, but right. you know, just layering on some additional skills and tools. Right. right. But I think it's fun. I, and kind of to really try and um, drum up a community of folks who can advocate for uh, the right kinds of data in their tools. Yeah. I'm interested to learn what that is and where to find it. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping to learn some things from you all as well. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll peace out, but thank you. I appreciate your help <laughs> awesome. and I'll check in yeah. with you later. And yeah, let me write down a reminder to check into your account after this. Yeah. 
Yeah, it could be a, the all caps thing, or perhaps I'm not part of a group. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know either. I'll figure it out then. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Welcome, folks. I just came on early to, uh, I don't know, answer questions or anything if anybody had trouble accessing the materials. Hi, Erin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Sorry, I'm going was popping in early to <laughs> mm -hmm. just make sure I was here. So I've got to get myself all set up now. Yeah. All right. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks. My whole team is in another meeting at the moment that I'm sure will run late. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, right. And I'm expecting, I don't know, decent crowd today. You know, are you one of the organizers or one of the participants? I'm the organizer. I'm uh, so I'm Aaron Sarwinski. I'm the one who uh, uh, my team and I built this program um, modeled after our like summer school, week long summer school experience at, at Carnegie Mellon. And um, so I manage a learning engineering team and we uh, build all kinds of course content all the time. And I'm really active in ICICLE, which is a learning engineering society and uh, just trying to promote you know the skills that are needed to do learning engineering. Awesome all right wonderful. Nice to meet you. How many people ended up um, joining the program Aaron? So 20 people signed up um, and only a like one that I know of officially dropped out, which allowed you to come into the program off the waiting list. I haven't been told that anybody else has been, um, has swapped out like that. And it, it, it's fine. We're, this is a pilot. So this is the first time we're running this. And then we plan to, you know, collect lots of data and iterate on it and do it again in March for SUNY. Oh, okay. So awesome. uh, all the folks that were on the wait list um, will have the opportunity to sign up for that session. Um, it looks like so far people participating is about um like three quarters of the group so about not not all 20 of course but like you know 12 ish 15 ish so okay yeah i signed i applied within not very long of when it was posted they're like they're like nope it's closed yeah so it's, it, it was filled in like a day <laughs> or yeah it was day. pretty wild mm. yeah yeah, well, I hope you guys find it worthwhile and, uh, you know, want lots of feedback to make it even better. So, great. I'm going to probably wait for my team to come in and like a few other folks to join the call, probably get started about five after ish. So I'm going to turn off my camera so you're not watching my head zip back and forth. <laughs> okay. Sure, no problem. So I'm still here. I'm still listening to you, but I'm sure cool. that that looks crazy sauce. <laughs> it's on the... I think we'll take a couple more minutes for folks to join in. I figured that, yeah, I told everyone here that we'd get started about five after. That should be good. Awesome. 
and I didn't leave room for us to introduce ourselves. So we should. <laughs> Beth, I love your little doggy picture. That makes me smile. Thank you so much. She is asleep on the floor next to me. So he's also attending the course today. <laughs> love it. I think after COVID, we all realized we have the most educated um, toddlers and pets, probably <laughs> in the history of mankind, humankind, I should say. Oh, yeah. So while we're waiting for folks, uh, I have a little story about that. So I worked from home. I worked from home for a long time. And my, when my daughter was younger, you know, to your point, she would hear me on the phone all the time. And um, when she got into grade school, she came home one day and she said, Mom, the teachers are not teaching me the way I need to learn. <laughs> I'm like, where did you get that? She's like, listening to you. <laughs> I'm like, you were taking that out of context. <laughs> but... <laughs> or she wasn't, and that's I, even scarier. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, and so then I had to, you know, I'm glad you have this, you know, I'm thinking in my head, you know, metacognition is important, so it's good. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, you also have to, learn how to to handle sometimes you know folks that don't address your needs that way and you have to still learn <laughs> so to that point yeah having the kids <laughs> around listening to all the work talk doesn't leave yeah. an impression I think oh yeah we're training the next generation that's for sure yeah so welcome everyone, uh, folks, as you're, uh, if you just joined, I'm going to wait a few minutes, um, giving some folks time to get in and also watching my email in case anyone's having any issues getting into the course. I'm loving this bibliography already. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Digging in here. Um, the first book is looks really good. I'm not familiar with this one. Yeah. So for those of you who just joined, you probably didn't get um, Angela and I were talking. And she said she loves resources. So I shared this document. Um, it's just a collection of resources that I've collected over the years and tried to categorize um, good stuff. And you'll be exposed to some of those articles just as part of this course as well. I just wanted to add to that, um, The How Learning Works is a great book and they have a new edition yes. that's now eight research-based principles. Yes, I haven't updated my video. I, know, <laughs> Thank I, you have for that. To, I really want to get it though. It's I'm really gonna, great book. I'm gonna add that. And I don't think I've added the toolkit either, the uh learning engineering toolkit, which is also a new book. I don't know if I've added that. Um it, it looks like this one is um open source or free though that we could share with people and they don't have to purchase it. The how learning works seven research based principles. Uh if I have a link to it, um maybe. I just clicked on it. It looks like the whole thing's there. Okay, then I, I tried to find open source resources where possible to include in right. that list. Um, so new, how learning works. I'm writing a note. And um, LA Toolkit. And actually, let me see if that even is there. Oh, it is. It's under learning engineering as a discipline. I didn't add all of the. I didn't add a link to it though. 
Okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited to kick this off. This is a pilot version of our Learning Engineering Fellowship Program. Um, it's modeled after our uh, Learn Lab Summer School that we have once a year at Carnegie Mellon University in person, where folks come in, learn some stuff about learning engineering, build a little mini course, deliver it, get data um, from like fellow classmates, and then see how that data looks and how you can develop improvement plans for your course materials. Um, I'm Erin Sorwinski. I'm a uh, the manager of learning engineering and product development at the Simon Initiative, which is um, at Carnegie Mellon University. And, um, and it's like an umbrella organization. And underneath that is the Open Learning Initiative, with which many of you might have heard about already and might even be using some materials out of OLI. Um, I'm joined here with my team and fellow folks who helped uh, build this, and um, I am going to, going to let them introduce themselves, and then we're going to have a little uh, icebreaker activity. So, Tanvi, you want to go next, first, next? <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here with you. Uh, I'm a learning engineer at OLI, and I've been working for almost like three years now, three and a half years now over here um and before that i've just been had had a background in software engineering um really happy to be here and excited to uh know more about your backgrounds as well thanks Tommy. caitlin you want to go caitlin you're on mute Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin. I am a learning engineer at OLI. I've been here for about two years. And before that, I was a K-12 teacher. And I'm also very excited to be here with you and really learn from you because we don't get to talk to a lot of um, instructional designers in our time. So it's nice to be in a more mixed group. Sasha, you want to introduce yourself quickly? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Sasha. I'm on the learning engineering team at OLI. I've been at OLI for almost seven years um, and also really excited for this program and seeing what everyone does. Alex, I'm going to have you introduce yourself as well. Yes. Sure. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm a course for a specialist here at OLI, though I've delved into learning engineering. And uh, I'm going to audit this course and kind of go on the journey with you. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Yue? Hi, this is Yue, and uh, I'm an intern at OLI. As, uh, and hopefully I'll be a learning engineer because I'm still as a student, master student at a Meadows program, which stands for Master of Educational Technology and Applied Learning Science. And um, uh, I used to be also a teacher for several years and um, hoping to be a learning engineer. So being with you on this trip together can really inspire me and uh, learn from you. That's a really good chance and really nice to know all, all of you. Thank you. And then Laura, I know you just joined, but you want to introduce yourself quickly? Sure. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm sorry, my camera's not coming on right now. Here we go. Um, I'm also a student at Carnegie Mellon University and an intern here at OLI. It's very nice to know you all, and I'm excited about the journey that we're about to share as we learn more about learning engineering. Thanks, everyone. So I know all of you have uh, put some introductions into um, the discussion board, and I really thank you for that. I've read them all, and they're very interesting. You all come from very diverse backgrounds, and I'm very excited to, like some of others said, to learn from you as well. Uh, we're going to do a little uh, different approach for introductions instead of introductions, because you've already done that in the discussion board. We're going to do a little icebreaker exercise. So Give me a moment as I bring this up. Uh, let me give you, let me see where I am here. There we go. Uh, so, well, first, before that, I'll just go over the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to do an icebreaker. I'm going to give a quick introduction to learning engineering. 
talk a little bit about data. Again, I know you populate some things in the discussion board, but I thought we'd use that as a to talk through some more things about data. Uh, I'll go over some expectations for the whole program and what you can come to expect um, of the activities and things that are that we've uh, outlined for you. We can give you a quick tourist demo, um, a, an orientation to the uh, tourist platform that we use to develop courses and materials and that you'll be using to uh, build a little lesson yourselves. And we'll leave some time for uh, additional getting to know each other and questions and that sort of thing. So uh, let's get to know each other a little bit better with this uh, exercise. So we actually asked chat GPT for this because it was curious as to what it would come up with. And it gave us a lot. We nailed it and we narrowed it down. But if we go to this Google, Google Doc, and I'm going to share this in the chat here. So if you go to this doc, and I'll show it here in a second, um, and select, vote for what kind of instructional designer do you see yourself? as um so i'm gonna play along too and then we'll uh i'll ask for some volunteers to talk through why they picked the ones that they did so uh take some time you know to about five minutes to read and vote Yeah, let's stop the share while you guys vote and then we'll reveal the answers. I'm having the same issue. My plus sign clicking is not functional. Ah, really? Same. Me too. Huh. Okay. We tested this so many times. I wonder why it's not working. Let me make sure I have the share settings. Yeah, anyone can edit. Looks like some votes are coming through, but I can't make a vote on my end. Okay. It, it looks like someone has highlighted the document. Now, now maybe try it. That's mm -mm. so wild. This was a new thing I was trying with the voting. We didn't know how it would work out, but <laughs> I guess we know now. Okay. Well, then let's just chat about it. Let me pull those up again. So instead of voting, I guess, I thought it'd be cool to see how many people we had in each category, but... um. I don't know who wants to share. What do you uh, most empathize or or see yourself as? I know they're not all perfect, but if you had to pick one, what do you think? I think it's hard to pick one. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my first answer. But the facilitator at the bottom is where I lean. Cool. We could raise hands in Zoom. Yeah, that's a good idea too. 
Okay, who voted for innovator? Anyone? Let me get a better view of the class here. Okay, Ashley. Cool. So, what makes you an innovator? Do you think? Your um, maybe it's just sort of the discipline I'm in. Pharmacy. We tend to be pretty uh, black yeah. and white. We don't like anything too creative or gray. Um, I don't personally associate with <laughs> the discipline that I have found myself in. So, um. I tend to think a little bit more outside the the box. Um, that being said, I also kind of think a lot about like the research side of things, just because that's a big part of my my job. So yeah. um, nobody wants to read something that's already been done. <laughs> right, right. Interesting. I always say that learning design is both a science and an art, right? And you you tend to be more on the science side, I guess. Of things. <laughs> um. Anyone who's some my fellow strategists, because that's how I feel I am. Oh, did someone have a hand raised to say something? You guys are, can feel free to just speak up. Any fellow strategists? Hello, this is Don Kayo Kawaba. I think I like to know where I'm going, and I also like to know that I got there. So that's why. That's why I'm the strategist. Yeah, I picked that one as well because I feel like I'm I really I really like the project management aspect of of you know developing courses. I don't know for me, I, I mean I like all aspects of learning design, but to me I like this like you, I like to things see things check off and get done and be produced. Um what about empathetic guide? Oh nice, Allison. Yeah, I just, um, I always think about my experience as a student when I'm thinking about learning materials. So I just like feel alongside with them when they get confused or overwhelmed. And so that's kind of what I have an eye towards when I'm thinking about things. But I was caught between that and visual designer. Oh, so. nice. Yeah, super cool. I always say that like when we're doing learning design, we're like channeling the students, right? We're, we're putting ourselves in the place of that novice and going through the materials and looking for places where, you know, confusion sticks out or, um, you know, things could be just made just slightly better to, you know, make things clearer um, and more concise. So that's great. Yeah, and absolutely. being a visual designer helps significantly. I wish I was more of a graphic artist and could really produce like great, um, uh, you know, um, infographics and things like that. I can give the the information for them, but I'm not the one that's usually good at doing that. So that's a great skill. Um, another skill that I, I really think is cool is the storyteller. Anybody here? You know, someone said they're a storyteller. Who's a storyteller? Alex. Yeah, I should have known. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a background in writing and I have a background in narrative design. So I think the approach to learning when it's, I mean, we'll get into this later, but like active learning is applicable learning and every human being tells stories, whether they know it or not. So, so that's where I am. Great. Thanks for sharing that. I have a, a friend who's, who's taken lots of classes in storytelling and she tries to weave it in all the time. And um, it's a skill that I haven't quite mastered, but I'm, I definitely admire it when I see it. Right. You can feel how you're pulled in and, and motivated by those stories. Um, so that's great. How about researcher? Any researchers in the mix here? Teresa. My team will tell you I am the theorist. Mm -hmm. I dig into that stuff. Oh, come on. When you looked at my answer, I talked about art. <laughs> Colors <laughs> arcs model, and I talked about community of inquiry. Okay, yeah. um, it's it. That's just where my brain goes because that is what helps ground me in what I do, and it helps me then work better with my faculty as we design learning opportunities. But I also have a very strong affinity for the visual designer. Mm -hmm. um, 
because we have to remember as an instructional designer, what is the second part of our name? Designer. So understanding, um, you know, basic design theory, layout, how important things like white space are. So mm -hmm. I, I see myself in both of that, but I guess still more the researcher, because then when you think about design, I think about message design and that's a lot of what this is based on. So, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you really take that art and science and really smash them together. Good. Yeah, good, good. Um, and, and of course, we're always, you know, part of this course is to hopefully expose you to some things, some research articles and models and things that you might not have been um, exposed to before. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. And the whole point of that is to get inspiration from that research and start to think about how you apply those Um in your designs and uh and test them actually and kind of experiment with them right um so great um so visual designers we have a couple who who said that secondary but Kristen what do you think about uh your visual design um uh, I'm kind of uh, very similar to what um Teresa had said um I I, I really much appreciate the researcher aspect I am um, always also looking at theory to kind of I, I, I work at a research institution, so I ah. always go back to theory to like ground it back in that evidence base. But right. I am very visual design always influences. So I have an art background oh, and it I strongly believe that the way you present information and the way that it appears on the page can either induce a cognitive overload or it can help you digest that information better, how you chunk that information up, are you using headings? Um, so I always go back to, I think that's kind of the main part for me is I always go back to the visual design, but then also what theories, yeah, which is probably why multimedia learning theory is like my favorite series. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> I, I bet. I bet. And, uh, you know, we're starting to delve into and trying to actually build up some literature around, um, cognitive accessibility. And uh, so if you, I would, we'd love to hear any uh, resources you might have uh, on that as we're trying to kind of uh, do a little bit of a meta analysis and a literature review on what's out there and trying to add to that uh, landscape. So we're always looking for folks who are interested in that kind of stuff. And then facilitator, quite a few of you, uh, you know, I think it's part of all of our jobs to be a facilitator. Anybody see that as their favorite part of the job? Yeah, Beth. I think part of the reason I gravitate towards that is that I don't want to hear myself talk for however long the class is. And so I really do just want to bring in other perspectives. But then I also get really excited by how other people think about things and hearing that and incorporating that into whatever it is we're building on and doing next. So I just I just like to hear other people have to say, because often they know be things better than I do or in different ways. And that's just really valuable to me. Excellent. Yeah. And that part of the facilitator that we all do is kind of drawing out the information from the, the subject matter experts or whoever we need and, you know, massaging that into something that's useful. Uh, Sasha, you also, I think, raised your hand about being a facilitator. Do you want to say some words about that? Um, yeah, uh, just, right, ultimately, in order to get learning, you need the people who are learning to want to do it and get into it. Uh, otherwise, the most you can do is just talk at people and, you know, maybe threaten to fail them or something. Uh, <laughs> right. And so I think that, you know, thinking about kind of what involves the students uh, and what helps them get into the learning and you know the reason we want to teach something is that it's awesome and we think people knowing it would be awesome and so uh kind of getting that across to people uh sounds like a core of education to me yeah definitely that whole like engagement and motivation you know it's not enough just to put a bunch of words on a page and have it chunked appropriately but you also have to kind of put in hooks right to help draw people out and I have to admit, this is my first, I, I give a lot of presentations and I run workshops, but I have to tell you, this is the first time I'm running like a course. So to me, this is kind of new. Um, and so I'm learning uh, how to hear my voice better in this kind of <laughs> environment. So bear with me. Yeah, Colleen. 
Did you send that? Um, I read these as what kind of instructional designer I am as opposed to instructor. Yeah, sure. So that's why I also voted for facilitator because mm -hmm. I see it as my role in helping the subject matter experts when they're deciding what they're going to do or what they want. So they tell me kind of what they hope and then I will investigate and try to make it happen. And so that was kind of the take I had as opposed to yeah. me as the instructor. Yeah, a lot of these, I mean, we are thinking of ourselves as uh, I was considering these um learning designer kind of uh labels you know and so you you hit the nail on the head I mean we really do have to to draw out of folks and and sometimes I wanted to mention that research back backing helps significantly when you're talking to subject matter experts sometimes that's the only thing they might respond to when you're trying to uh talk them into a certain direction or approach because you know they really see things as this is the this is the information we need to impart on the students and we're all here to say, okay, well, here's how the students need to hear it and consume it, right? Um, if you really want to be successful as a teacher. So um, yeah, we are, I think we all have really strong facilitation. Uh, you kind of have to, it goes with the, the territory, right? So anyone else uh, want to share anything if someone didn't speak up? Okay. So let me get back to my presentation here. I'm going to open it up. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about data. Um, I know that I read all of your responses in the um, discussion board and thank you all for participating in that. So I saw a lot of great stuff like pre and post data, engagement metrics, feedback and surveys, um, time spent uh, and, uh, you know, quality reviews, LM measurement, um, and y'all, some of you shared some great resources. Uh, thanks to whoever shared the resource about learning styles. And then someone mentioned something about Nearpod and Pen Deck. I was really curious about that. Who was the person that wrote, wrote uh, suggested those resources? That was me. I feel like they should pay me for how much I talk about them. <laughs> um, I love those because I think it helps people that aren't as willing to talk in front of a class. They can like write it on the board. And so then they or like write it in there in the slides and stuff. So they don't have to talk, but they can still share and participate oh, so nice. that in the classroom experience in that way. Great. Thanks for sharing those. I also want to just, it's you great. know. What was <laughs> oh that's even better, um, you know part of this this whole fellowship program is for you all to learn from each other. So I really do encourage you sharing any kind of tips and tricks and resources and tools that you use in as you answer the discussion boards. So thanks for doing that. Um, so anyone want to talk? Anybody feel strongly about the fact that um, that that you have. Is there data that you wish you had that you don't have at your fingertips that you can think of? Like, think about those things like, um, or even tools, like, you know, we have, we can collect data on assessments very easily, right? But are there tools to show, you know, trends over time and, um, you know, comparisons? Uh, do you, let me ask this question too. Do you have these things as you would get them, like pre and post data, for example, tied specifically to outcomes? Does that happen in the tools that you use right now? And Angela, what would you what would you like to say? Um, I just kind of wanted to reflect on one of the reasons I'm interested in this fellowship is it seems like a few people also have K through 12 backgrounds and we work in higher ed. Mm -hmm. So the way we use data in K through 12, there's so much data on those kids mm -hmm. on everything. And I was an exceptional ed teacher and I could just kind of go in the file and not that it drove every, not that it controlled everything, but it was just kind of useful to have that as a measure and then use it to kind of go back and forth with. 
as someone who teaches in a graduate program in adult ed, I don't do any of that kind of formalized testing at all. So I don't use data and I can't use data that way. Um, and so when I'm in all three of these questions, I'm like, oh, I, this is my answer to all of them. Oh, ah. <laughs> you know, so this is, I'm, I'm really interested in this because I do kind of, we're, we use D2L, we're on Brightspace in, in, in SUNY right now. And I, I look at the time on task only for the students who are doing a horrible job mm -hmm. and never look at it for the ones who are strong. Mm -hmm. And there's a few data metrics that I use, but I use them as kind of like messy documentation for people who are failing as opposed to the whole point is to be proactive and make them not fail in the first place. So I'm, I'm interested and hungry for whatever I can use in a graduate program that I don't have these piles and piles of data on my students that you do in the K through 12 world by default, you have all this data that I didn't even know I was lucky to have. Uh, but sometimes you have too much data too, right? Yes. Uh, it's, yeah. Sometimes it can be, and if it's, if it's data that's just kind of thrown at you in the aggregate, it's hard to sometimes make sense of it, right? Like, well, what, what does this mean? Or what is this tied to? Some of that data I found on in other applications, other tools don't even tie it to outcomes. So it's hard for me to tell, like you kind of, you're still making assumptions about the data you're given. Like you're giving metrics and you're giving like what you think is is proof of something but it's hard then to know what exactly you just still it's still proxies for the data that you want, which is, you know, how are students performing? What are they struggling with? What skills do I need to bolster a little bit more? Um, and I'm wondering if any of you uh, actually have tools or access to that kind of data and do you use it in a regular basis? I can address that a little bit when you talked about outcomes. Brightspace does have the functionality to tie um, course learning activities to outcomes, both in a course and at the institutional level. Oh, nice. Um, there's been training um, for the instructional designers and LMS managers on how to do that. Um, but with just this semester being the first semester, all of SUNY's on Brightspace, Right. I think there's just a time function and things. But when you look at the institutional goals and the goals of the system with DEI and things like that, they can actually tie certain assignments in certain classes to that learning objective at an institutional level and then pull all the data out to see how did students do on it and rank, come up with how students are achieving um, that outcome and is is a campus doing it but again that's a little longer term and yeah you have to get to, that set up but time. the functionality is there which is beneficial to to all of us that's excellent and that's good for you to let others know in case they didn't know that um now i'm interested in what the grain size of those outcomes are uh and if the grain size of those outcomes are are helpful as well because i think if they're capturing it at kind of an institutional level it's like capturing it you know at the standards level in k-12 that's hard to really diagnose what students are having trouble with kristen did you have something to add yeah i know that one of the things that we're struggling with um with the bright bright space and like the learning outcomes and be able to tie things to is the like the setup of that whole process of like the, yeah. just setting it up within the system but also um we can't necessarily like as instructional designers in in, in our institution i don't have access to anyone's courses unless mm. they give me access so instructional technologists can go in to specific classes but that's really to help with the tech aspect of things so then it's like communicating to our faculty and then like what assessments are going to be tied to those like it, it's it's like a really big mess of organization and setting that whole up, setting that process up so I feel like in theory it, it's awesome but we haven't really figured out if we're going to use it logistical wise so 
That's really helpful. Um, and, you know, I have to say that one of the reasons uh, my team and I built this program is because I feel like, you know, I'm very active in Icicle, which is a learning engineering community. And if you don't know about it, you guys should all check it out. Um, if you just Google Icicle, it's out of IEEE, which is an engineering society. Um, but one of the things that, that one of the discussions that's constantly in that group is, um, what's the difference between, you know, an instructional designer and a learning engineer? And one of the reasons we built this program, one of my motivations anyway, is I feel like instructional designers are learning engineers who just haven't had access to the data that, you know, that could be collected because there's not a lot of systems that do it. Um, and, you know, you guys are talking about Brightspace, basically, probably just rolling that out, essentially. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. And I have talked to Brightspace folks a few years ago, or D2L, D2L folks a few years ago, and I was excited about some of the stuff they were rolling out in their platform. But then, you know, they roll it out. And again, the access to it is given to administrators, technologists. And, you know, part of what I try to do as part of Icicle and hoping to do as part of this program is give you guys the language and the people to like go to and say, hey, I need this data. And here's all the reasons why it's going to make everything better. You know, all of the courses, our jobs, everything, you know, and getting into the right gain, brain size, really, so that you can seriously diagnose when students are struggling with specific skills. Um, in the meantime, though, you'll have access to our platform. I, I've been, I feel like I've been lucky and that I came to OLI oh, a long time ago. I've been back and forth at OLI for about 10 years now. And um, I I went off and did worked at some other places and didn't have access to that kind of data, which is one of the reasons I came back because it's one of the only places I know where I can design like this. I can collect that data. I can see it in real time. And, and start making plans about how I'm going to, you know, better my designs of, uh, according to that data. And so that's one of the things I'm hoping uh, to help all of you guys learn how to do and really just give, ac give access. It's not something that you really need to learn how to do. I think you all are hungry for it. Um, so it's just a matter of getting exposure and some other tools that, that we use to, to analyze that data as well that are available to all of you. Um, for free, you just got to know what kind of data and how to use them a little bit. So we're hoping to give you some uh, access to all that. So <laughs> I was sick last week. Uh, so I'm coming off the end of a cold-ish, COVID-ish. I don't know what it was. Didn't test positive, but who knows these days. Okay, um, give me a second while I, I wanted to, oops. Open this up. Okay, so, um, Thank you for participating and talking about data. That was really uh, helpful. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to make sure I said about this. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. Thanks. So I talked about Icicle and um, Icicle is, and let me get this, um, oops this well i was gonna get the link for you but i can't get into that slot right now so you guys want to know more about icicle and i would encourage you because one of the things that um i'm hoping to do and i lost my screen here <laughs> is to uh build a community of folks who are you know, we already have these communities that exist to invite you all to be more part of this larger and learning engineering community and uh, participate as much as possible. So I just put in the chat the link to Icicle. And Icicle came up with this definition of learning engineering, which I must say is, um, 
quite broad. Uh, and if you read it, I mean, it, it sounds a lot like learning design as well. You know, a pro process and a practice that applies learning sciences, human-centered design um, with data-informed decision-making. And I think, again, the only difference between that and what you all do today is just that access to data, right? Um, and if you, oops, uh, this diagram is the learning engineering process that uh, Icicle came up with to describe exactly what a learning engineer or a learning engineering approach does. And again, I don't think there's anything new and different there um, that you don't already probably do. It's just a matter of kind of codifying it and, uh, and, and promoting it as a profession. Here at uh, CMU, we take our inspiration from Herb Simon. So I mentioned earlier that I am uh, a manager in the Simon Initiative. Uh, the Simon Initiative uh, was named after Herb Simon, who is a Nobel um, laureate, you know, winner. Uh, and he used to be, and he was a professor, a late professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And he uh, really believed that learning and teaching needed to be a, uh, a team activity uh, with lots of different folks in the mix to um, carefully design the learning, teach it, collect data, iterate, improve. And so um, we have this umbrella organization. We don't have a, a school of education at CMU. So the Simon Initiative is a place where folks can go, teachers can go to get teaching advice. Um, they can collaborate on projects. They can perform research and we actually fund research projects uh, in teaching and learning. And uh, we have this larger ed tech ecosystem that allows us at Carnegie Mellon and actually other institutions as well. The Open Learning Initiative, as you know, designs courses that's, that are used all over the world. And so uh, the Simon Initiative brings together this ecosystem of being able to design and deliver, uh, collect data and analyze that data with some additional tools that help with um, incorporating, you know, artificial intelligence or codifying uh, natural language um, information, qualitative information to collect on the courses. So we really take this seriously and we're we're really seen as the um as the the home of learning engineering even even by icicle uh they really look to us as you know the, the kind of the home and the and the birthplace of learning engineering and then other places have really adopted it as well such as you know MIT and Boston College has a learning engineering master's program now and um uh, really uh, it's it's expanding so our idea of learning engineering is really trying to make learning something that is observable and measurable and in a nutshell the way we do that is you know you can't crack someone's head open and actually see the processing going on so you have to create a model of what that learning um how that learning is going to unfold what outcomes they the students need to learn and just document it. So you'll hear me talk a little bit later about how learning engineering is really akin to, um, uh, you know, the scientific method, you know, trying to identify a problem or, or capture and articulate your hypotheses about the learning design and, um, and then measuring against it. And so we start by creating these models. And when we say a model of learning, we really just mean what are the outcomes and, and really written in a measurable way so that we can document our observations against them. And we take that learner model and we build that with theories of learning that we know have come out of the learning sciences and uh, incorporate that into our model. We design that learning to be very, you know, we carefully design it and we uh, instrument it. And instrumenting it uh, means actually, um, it's, it's funny, we just had a long discussion in one of my ICICLE meetings about what is, in, in, what is instrumentation. And it's funny how it's, 
it, it, depending on if you're a learning scientist or a researcher or a learning designer, you kind of kind of all describe it a little bit differently. But it's basically just wiring it up to collect data, essentially. Um, and we do that using technology usually so we can get that data very easily. And then we analyze that and hopefully it informs us about um, the learner model and how well and fit that model is. Do we have the right skills and objectives and outcomes that we're trying to get students to practice and learn? Um, or maybe there's some tweaks to even those we find with some of our tools that um, you might find that when you're collecting data against activities that are tagged with outcomes, sometimes there's hidden skills that, the, that uh, doing this process will unveil for you. You'll see in the data that there's something going on that you, you just untangle these and make them two different outcomes and provide targeted practice in both how well uh, the students can do as a result. And I think you'll see that, um, see a few examples of that in the next session that we have next week. Um, so then we uh, hopefully in the aggregate and taking lots of this data in, in you know, a big way, we might actually learn some new things about how people learn. And hopefully those can drive new insights into the learning sciences. And essentially this whole cycle of learning engineering is what I'm hoping you all will embrace that you'll become these um, citizen scientists as, as you might've heard us uh, talk about in the modules that you've done um, where you know, you're just looking to articulate more of those hypotheses that you're planning to test and testing them out and hopefully get you in a position where with the data that you collect, you might be also able to write some case studies and papers and contribute back to the larger um, profession essentially. I'm going to take a second to uh, look at the chat here. Well, I'm glad you guys are sharing stuff. Thank you for doing that. That's great. Um, so uh, we know also that uh, we actually know uh, what we know about our own learning is is really difficult to articulate. So you guys know this working with subject matter experts, you, sometimes drawing out exactly what the students need to learn is sometimes really difficult. And it's because experts can really only describe 30% of what they know. And I don't, I don't know how accurate that number is. I'm sure it came from, from research, but it's really hard uh, for, for folks who know things so deeply to be able to remember back to how they learn them and then articulate and break down those concepts that they know in a way that then you can start to unfold it again for the students. I mean, that's what you all do every day. I'm sure it's like you're helping these subject matter experts, you know, okay, how, do the, what do the students need to learn? Okay, how do they need to learn this? What is the best way? And then offering some, um, some uh, recommendations based on that, because again, they're the experts and it's really hard for them. They just, they know these theories like the back of their hand and they're not used to really articulating uh, what are all the little pieces uh, that they that students need to learn. So um, I have a note here. So I think I said, where do the models come from? In K-12, those models are sometimes just given to us, right? In the form of standards. And I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier that uh, standards are nice, but they're usually at a weird grain size and that, that's hard to measure. And so I know what we do uh, at OLI and what, we, what I've been practiced at is breaking those down into grain sizes, measurable uh, sets of skills that you can tag directly to activities and questions to know as students answer and practice those that they are, um, you know, we're, we're collecting that data against those finer grained outcomes that we can then um, aggregate up to the larger learning objective. And I've seen that work very well, uh, even at the size of um, competencies, you know, breaking competencies down into learning objectives and then breaking learning objectives down into skills and collecting data at all, all those levels. Um, and let's see, when developing models, um, yeah, I'm already, I've already said that it's really hard for educators um, and experts to really know exactly what what outcomes sometimes are their most appropriate. Um, 
And we also know that doing all of this now, we kind of do based on intuition. If we're not given the standards, then it's usually like a feeling or, you know, where are some other places we get outcomes? We get them from textbooks, you know, uh, we get them from other folks who've taught similar material. Um, sometimes, I mean, how many of you have had to reverse engineer outcomes from content? It's not exactly backwards design, right? But sometimes you just have to do that. Have you, any of you had experiences having to do that? It's sometimes no fun to have to reverse engineer outcomes because ideally we all know we want to start with outcomes and then uh, and build the materials from there, right? A true backwards design process. Um, so let me... So we call all of this uh, because it's really intuition based until we start collecting data, uh, learning design as hypothesis. Basically, the types of problems and activities that we build um, in order to measure the outcomes that we want students to know and be able to perform is a hypothesis of how we think the students, what, what outcomes we think the students need to learn. And then we're really hypothesizing, okay, this is the best way we think they're going to learn these skills. And so I'm really trying to um, help folks understand that this is the case. So we should be documenting, we should be acting more like citizen scientists and documenting our hypotheses. Um, that includes, um, you know, our pedagogical choices. So, you know, do we choose active learning or do we do something different? Um, what do we think we know about the learners? So we're, you know, we're assuming a lot of, we're assuming the prior knowledge that those learners are coming in with. Sometimes we might know through, um, you know, prior knowledge surveys or pretests, um, which is great. Uh, but, you know, we're still the starting place when we first design a course is, is really um, our best guess. And there's domain specific assumptions that we make, such as, you know, math, uh, needs to be taught with lots of practice um, that, you know, uh, I don't know, what are some other domain specific type uh, assumptions that we make? Like, you know, when you're teaching, you know, you can't teach writing without writing, right? That, I mean, those are big grain size ones, but uh, do any of you have any other examples of just domain specific things that we know as learning designers work and try to incorporate when we're working in those domains. Do you know even what I mean by that? Some people have some answers in the chat. Oh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Sasha. I'm not really good at looking at the chat. Yes, sciences require labs. Yeah, see, that's a good one. Um, and writing intensive requires long essays. <laughs> yeah, I love that one too. I once uh, I worked for Western Governors University for a little bit, and um, one of the things that they did for their English composition, the first year English composition, the students had to write a twenty-page research paper with full citations. And I was like, you don't even teach them how to do citations. And that was the thing that was tripping up most students. And you're like, well, what are you actually wanting and needing to measure? Is it citations or is it just writing composition? Um, <laughs> never learned anything sciencey from a lab. <laughs> That's funny. Um, hot button issues. Yeah. So there's a lot of assumptions and documenting those is is good because then you can start to purposefully design things to collect the data. And that's really what I'm calling, um, what a colleague of mine came up with, but I adopted it, data generated design. You know, you're designing, you're not just doing a learning design in a human centered way. You're also need to think about it in 
what kind of data, what kind of measurements am I collecting? And that's really what we're trying to, to give you all practice at here. Um, and then there is uh, within content uh, assumptions as well, you know, what the instructional methods, what assessments you're using, what activities that you're building. Um, so it's really starting to think of, of learning design as hypothesis in, in doing that kind of documentation, even if it's just mentally, even if it's just not even written down, just having that in the back of your mind. So, oops. So, uh, yeah, talking more is that learning design as hypothesis and putting it up against um, the scientific method. It's really, you know, identifying and um, documenting your hypotheses. What problems are you trying to solve with this particular design? And, and, and no, uh, the other thing that this idea of learning design as hypothesis helps is it, I feel like it takes the pressure off of us, right? We have to know like not every learning design is going to be perfect and not every thing, every activity we embed or design for the students is going to engage them or is going to, to hit home with every single student. And so it's important to really, again, document those assumptions, have a plan and a purpose to the activities that you build so that you're collecting that data to see if they are the appropriate activities. Are they helping the students? And if not, what part of it isn't helping the students? And is it does it require just a little tweak or a whole redesign of the entire course? Um, again, when I was at Western Governors, one of the things they would do is if the numbers were low and students weren't completing or they weren't um, passing the assessments, they would throw out an entire course, you know, three, four years worth of work, they would just start all over. And uh, I always found that like, you know, if you were collecting that data along the way, then you could at least salvage the places that were working, right? You didn't have to throw the whole thing out. You could probably just iterate and refine the places where students were still struggling. So, um, you know, always using backwards design. We start with the outcomes. I don't have to tell you all that. You you know that that's the most important thing to do is you start with the outcomes, you work backwards from there, you figure out what how uh, you'll measure those outcomes with assessments, what activities will, will help students practice those skills in a in a repeatable way. And, and then lastly, you think about, okay, what is the content needed to actually help these students perform at a level that you expect. So it's it's that backwards design process. And so uh, as part of learning design's hypothesis, you're, you're doing that, you're performing an experiment, you're running your course, you're collecting that data and analyzing that data, and then you're forming some conclusions. And we're hoping that as part of this program, as you go through, you're going to be going through these steps and what it's gonna culminate in is a, um, is an improvement plan for the materials that you design in this course. So the way we do this is actually pretty simple. Um, and again, it's because we have a platform that's built just to do this really. Um, so we start with the skills. We start, we actually take learning outcomes. We have two tiers of learning outcomes. So whatever outcomes we have, we break those down into um, component skills is what we call them. You'll hear them referred to as some other things as we go. Um, and, and when we release uh, the terminology, we have a whole terminology um, section that we're going to add to the appendix and the tourist course that you're working through. You'll see that there's you know learning outcomes, learning objectives, knowledge components, skills. And we've actually had a really hard time uh, defining those differently or, or accepting the fact that they might be the same thing. But either way, the, the idea is to, to break them down into a grain size that are measurable. And then once we do that, we make sure we design both practice um, activities and, um, and assessments to each of those skills. And one of, the, um, one of the key things about this is numbers. Again, like if, you're, if we're thinking of this as a scientific method, you know, if you just have one activity or one question that uh, is against one skill, it's really probably not enough to draw any conclusions from. So really starting to think of things in terms of that data collection and that um, uh, creating 
valid and reliable uh, data to draw from. So uh, when you're designing a whole semester long course though, and you're doing it in a platform like Taurus or, or anywhere where you're really, you're providing both the textbook and the practice, it's really easy to miss um, skills. Uh, it's really easy to miss practice to specific skills. So even doing this for years and years and years, if I design a whole course, I'll still find like, oh, I don't have, I have one question against this one skill. That's not enough. So that's a part, a place I'll have to go in and iterate. And sometimes you don't have the time, right? To, I, I think I've told folks, ideally I'd want 20 questions per skill or 20 activities per skill. That's probably never going to happen. <laughs> not, not in a first take anyway. I don't think I've ever designed a course that gave me the luxury of designing that many questions against every single skill. So we try and shoot for at least three and then see where the data shows us we need more. But the idea is to make sure that those connections are made uh, to every skill in both uh, a formative way in the practice and in a summative way in the assessments. And again, I've built, built courses where you could probably even see here, uh, I think this slide was actually built to show that you're going to miss things sometimes. Sometimes you miss a skill and you realize through the analysis of the data that, oh, here's a skill I wasn't even giving students practice on and it's tripping them up in learning and being able to be successful with other skills. Uh, sometimes you find that you're providing practice, but not assessing. I, and I know that sounds like you wouldn't never do such a thing, but it happens when you're when you're dealing with all these, you know, with 100 skills in a semester long course. Um, and the, I think the worst thing you can do is assess uh, assess on on skills that you haven't provided practice on. So this whole um, our whole platform is really built to really pay close attention to just this, you know, skills, activities and assessments. So the data that we can get um, is, and when you start to think about all the data that you could collect, we really, uh, it comes down to these, you know, five-ish things. You know, you want data that's going to tell you how well the course is performing. You know, that's going to tell you about the course itself. Um, we talk about this and you'll see this play out in the form of, um, audit tools. So we have in, in our platform, the ability to see exactly what I just showed you in that last slide, like what outcomes might not have enough practice or assessment. And it's those numbers that matter. So you want to collect data on, on that, that helps you easily find those, those areas of um, improvement. Of course, learner performance. But it's not just about how students are doing on a whole assessment, right? It's how they're doing against each individual skill. And it's what, how are they getting to correctness? So again, if you just build one question against an activity or against a, a, a skill or an outcome, how do you know that they actually answered it and didn't guess, you know? So you have to really build in, um, you have to build for the data that you need to collect to be able to actually draw conclusions from it. So, you know, uh, not just how students are, if students are getting to correctness, but there's patterns to that as well. Did they get, like say there's five questions against a skill, did they get the first two correct and then bomb the third one, but then get the other two correct? Like those patterns of how they go through those questions actually can tell you something about how the students are processing that information. And if the feedback is included, which we do in Taurus, we really design it like a multiple choice question has so many parts to it. It's not just a question and some distractors and the right answer. It's the question. It's thinking about those distractors as actual um, pieces of data and what they're measuring. So you want those those answer options to be valid and, and real answer options, real mistakes the student might, might make. And then we build in the feedback that addresses that mistake. And 
when you do that, we also design hints as well in some of our questions. And when you do that and you do that over time and you develop many questions like that, you start to see a pattern. You'd like to see a pattern where the student might answer wrong, get the feedback or use a hint. And then the next question, they actually can maybe get it right that time because the feedback corrected them. You should start to see uh, an error rate across multiple questions that goes down, essentially. You want them to get, they should be getting more and more successful. And then when they're not, that tells you something about like really deeply about their performance and exactly what they're struggling with. Uh, we wanna collect data on usage, of course, uh, because if you see that a student is performing low, then you also wanna know what else might be going into that. So you do wanna see always, you know, and some of you mentioned this in the, in the discussion board, you know, engagement metrics, time spent on task. You know, we don't take, um, those things lightly, but we also don't put a ton of stock into them. To me, it's like where you look when you see that performance isn't isn't um, being met, then you start to see, okay, what else is going on here? Um, and you can use those those usage statistics to help figure out, oh, oh, well, this student didn't, they just skipped right to the assessment. They didn't even use any of the practice that was given to them. That's important to know, right? Um, and then of course, feedback. Feedback, qualitative data is just as important, if not um, sometimes more telling than the quantitative data. And again, when you're collecting good quantitative data, it's that qualitative data that will give you better insights into what might be actually going wrong if when you start to see things that are awry in the, in the quantitative data. Um, so, Things like for the course itself is like how many activities, how much formative practice versus summative practice do you have? Um, how much uh, coverage do you have across the uh, each skill um, and across the course? Uh, I think I mentioned, yeah, correctness, hints. If you, if you incorporate hints and you see students needing a lot of hints, then that's also a key that, um, you know, something more might be needed to bolster their their learning. Um, I said page views, video views, activities completed, number of attempts can all tell you about usage. If students just blow through and just randomly answer questions or did they seemingly take time and you can see the kind of thought process they used unfold as they approach every question. And then Feedback, we have lots of ways of doing this, but you know, surveys, smile sheets, we're used to those, right? Uh, anything with open-ended responses is usually helpful there. And um, of course, how, what, what student, what questions students ask in, in class or on discussion boards or anything like that. All of that data is really useful, uh, as you know, and, and we use all of it. Um, so, this is really an introduction to this program. It's an introduction to uh, learning engineering and um, the outcomes that we hope that you will gain from this program are, um, you know, are articulated here. These are our, our learning outcomes, designing activities that align. You probably already know how to do that, but really now with that measurement perspective in mind. Um, so, you know, building formative and summative assessments that that mirror those outcome verbs uh, so that you can um, actually learn how to build things in uh, an online system, even getting at higher order outcomes, uh, how higher cognitive level outcomes. Um, hopefully uh, uh, you'll get to analyze and um, use evidence-based instructional design practices. So that's a data generated design um, reflecting on learning science and hopefully just inspiring you with the different learning science um, uh, exposure we give you to the articles that we they, we want you to read. Um, and then you're going to get to actually uh, improve learning designs. Uh, we're not going to get to the point where you actually implement the improvements, but we're going to get you to a place where you can take the data and put a little plan together as to how you might iterate on that course. And then hopefully just engaging with each other and sharing things. Um, I am 
past the time that I should be for this. And I want to get to uh, a Taurus demo. So I want to just, uh, you know, the syllabus is um, available um, from, I think it's in the Taurus course. So uh, check it out. There's, you'll see all of the dates of when things are due. Um, we have these synchronous sessions. We also have office hours that on uh, Fridays at the same time, I believe, uh, you, if you miss a cl class or you're, you just want to talk shop, we're always, uh, we're always happy to do that. I could talk about instructional design all day long. Um, so feel free to join us in the office hours. Um, we have the Taurus course for you that we're, we're building and releasing content each week. Please take advantage of the surveys and, and assessments that we have available to you. Even if it seems like a question is super easy to answer, we really appreciate you just answering those because again, that's data collection for us to iterate on this whole program. And then there's going to be a project, uh, a project where you'll actually use Taurus to um, build some materials, uh, some activities, that then we're gonna all take each other's courses and generate that data so that we can start to analyze it. And this comes with a completion, um, a certificate of completion. And, and to get that certificate, we, it's, a, it's not a high bar, but we just ask that you participate, come to as, you know, as many synchronous sessions as you can, um, do the project best you can, that sort of thing. We're really um, excited to see what you all can do. So I'm not gonna go into details of that to just like uh, skip over to the tourist demo. Um, so the project uh, work for this week one is to start to think about your course topics and where you might get those materials. And if any of you need help with that, please let us know. Uh, we certainly um, have content you can use to build on if you want um, in, in a variety of subjects. An easy way to get content is also to just go out and find some open um, OER, open educational resources. Uh, and, and we really want you to chunk this as to be just a few pages of content because what we wanna focus on is creating those activities that you can collect data on. Um, start thinking about, if you have an idea of a course topic, um, then start thinking about what the prior knowledge needs of that audience are, where's their starting point, what problems and assumptions, what problems do you want to solve and what assumptions are you going to make about that content? And really start to document this somewhere, um, maybe as part of your uh, discussion posts. And then um, uh, models and outcomes, you'll be exposed to some new models and some um, and developing outcomes against these uh, for your lessons next. Okay, I've talked a lot. Any, any questions? Am I missing anything? Uh, before we get into a, a Taurus demo. Yeah, Addy. Addy is something that I have, I you know, near and dear to any uh, learning designer's heart probably knows it very well. And it's a good, it's a good model, but there's others. And that's the thing I wanted. Um, it wasn't until I started working with learning scientists here at CMU that I realized that there's other models that promote different things and help you think about chunking the content in different ways. And I'm just excited to share all that. I, I, I um, and, and the other thing I'm excited about is that module that you might've gone through on how to read research papers. I didn't learn until I was in a master's course at CMU that, that instructors usually expect you to read strategically. And, uh, you know, until I was given, a, like, a, literally, I had on my desk going through this course a, a pile of paper this big, and I couldn't believe I actually got through all those articles, but it was through this idea of strategic reading that helped me get through that course. So I wanted to share that, and uh, UA developed that model, that module was really well done. So I hoped it was helpful. Okay, I just want to keep track of the chat here. Okay, so Taurus orientation. And then this is probably, it's gonna be fast and furious. Um, and I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to meet uh, the team too, but I think you did that through introductions. So we can skip that. I just wanna focus on um, ex you know, showing you what Taurus is at the moment. So in the meantime, while I'm bringing this up, 
you have any questions, please feel free to, to come off uh, mute and just freely speak. Does everybody, did everybody get an authoring account? Did everybody go through that process of, of um, going to Taurus yet and getting an authoring account? Great. If anyone hasn't uh, or need help with that, just please let us know and chat and we can help you. Um, know that Taurus is our latest platform. It's being built from the ground up from like, you know, 15, 20 years actually of lessons learned from our old platform. Um, we're really excited about it, but know that it is being built like as we speak and there's new, um, new stuff being added to it all the time. So Basically, every time I give a demo, I'm kind of surprised sometimes by some new stuff. Uh, but let me take you into the, I'm going to show you the authoring. I would usually show you the student facing version first. Well, maybe I should do that first. So give me a second here. This is going to be a whirlwind orientation, but we can even do some of this in office hours too, if you guys get stuck at all. And need some help with stuff. Um, this time really flew by. I was too excited to talk to you all about um, things earlier. So I'll take you through a real quick version of um, what the students see, oh, well, or what the what the instructors see in this case. Uh, hold on, I should be able to find the version where I'm a student. Nope. Apologies. Okay, I'll just go in as an instructor, and then I'll show you what the students see. I have to keep moving the zoom. And I'm looking for stoichiometry. Just go everything. Sorry, the zoom window is very distracting. Is this is Tor is this an authoring software that then you load onto an LMS? So it's both a um it's both a uh, authoring platform and a delivery platform, but it can be embedded in an LMS. So you'll see in the Canvas course that we've embedded a Taurus course inside it, and then that serves as the the textbook and and practice. So that's essentially how it's used. So. I'm right now looking at it from an instructor view directly because you can also deliver directly out to students, which is what you all will do as part of this course. But yes, it can be embedded in an LMS. It is a tool in the LMS. Thank you. The Taurus course you all are accessing is through the Canvas LMS right now um, as students. And then I think what Erin is showing is through direct delivery right now. Yeah, so this is what students see. This is the student view. And I'm trying to get to um, a common area that I actually know because I don't know chemistry, <laughs> but I know how to, um, some cool stuff to show. Um, and it seems like I'm not finding it in this particular course. I don't know why. So I'll just keep going. So in... Uh, in a Taurus course, we have learning objectives that are prominently displayed at the top of the page, content that's developed. You can have, you can have um, rollover definitions. So essentially you can build a textbook. We have these uh, labels and the idea for these labels is to really, you know, um, we call it give semantic context to the content. So that like when we're looking at data that might come out of like, these questions, we can um, know a little bit about what those questions are about and what they might have already um, looked at before that. 
uh, the idea is also we can use these labels to do larger experiments. Like, does this example help or does this example help? We'll, we'll, we'll have the ability to embed A-B testing tools that are in development at the moment so that you could do some cool stuff like that. But the idea is that as students answer these questions, we're building the questions. Each of these answer options actually represents a common mistake the student might make in answering this question. And then the, the feedback is targeted to what they did. You know, so this is an electron, you know, I, I would say this feedback could be better and say exactly what the mistake is they made. But it's also even for correct answers, if I ever get to it, um, we also reinforce why it's correct so that if the student guesses, then they get some learning out of it. Uh, the idea is that if we can embed all the learning and just practice and questions, that would be the ideal. Of course, in a course like chemistry, you can't not introduce material first, but the idea is, if, is, is a student encounters each one of these questions, they are learning. And will the hypothesis is that the next question that they that they do, they'll get better at it and they'll start to see um, more and more practice it, with different types of questions in different ways, targeting all the same skills. Um, you know, we're collecting data on how well students are doing and hopefully correcting them in the process. And so we have a number of different question types and types of content that you can build in one of these courses. Um, I'm just showing you just a couple pages uh, quickly because I wanna get to a quick orientation to show you how to use Taurus. And there's a lot to it, but the orientation will at least give you an idea of where you can find things. And then, uh, cause I'm not gonna be able to tell you every little nook and cranny um, we have the ability to embed these like labs and different things um, from outside places as well. And then we also have some uh, ways of doing branching questions where based on an answer in this multiple choice, it might open up some more some more uh, options, adding scaffolding to the to the questions that um, the students got wrong. So uh, that was just a quick couple of pages from the student perspective. Uh, I wanna dig into um, authoring. And again, please come to the office hours on, um, is it Friday? I don't wanna say the wrong thing. I, I, I'm remembering it as Friday, Tondi, is that correct? Yeah, that's Friday. Okay, thank you. On Friday, if you are like, oh, you know, there, I want to try and do this thing. How do you do it? We can support you in, in doing it. Um, so I'm just going to go into, let's see, my rise and analysis course. So when you first start a project, and by the way, the way you do that is you'll be dropped into uh, something like this, and there won't be any courses here. I have, these are the courses I've just go to new project and name your project and you hit create and you'll be dropped into um you'll be dropped into a page like this i would uh suggest that you definitely describe your project um and there's some things you can control here that probably aren't even necessary so i'm going to skip over um but you can change the labels you can add collaborators, you can add new types, different types of activities. And what that does is help manage the toolbars that you see when you're in a page. And there's all kinds of things about data and duplication, but you essentially want to go to objectives. This is where you add learning objectives. And if you have sub objectives, you can add those as well here. And you can do that by just hitting create new objective. And then when you're in an objective, you can add um, add some objectives, create new ones or add an existing. And then you wanna go to curriculum. And in curriculum, you can add containers uh, or pages. Um, a practice page is just a regular page that you're gonna add formative practice to. A graded assessment is an assessment, a summative assessment. And why they're two different pages is 
a graded assessment will populate the grade book in an LMS. So if a person is using this course in an LMS, it will work with that grade book um, and add the assessments in this course to that grade book as well. Um, adaptive page, you know, I might even hold an, a lower, a later office hours on adaptive, but no, we have the capability to do some really cool things, uh, really immersive type activities. Um, and we do that with adaptive stuff. It's like, it's like having a, a wizard for a cognitive tutor, like right at your fingertips. And once you create a unit by just, you know, creating a unit like that, and you can go into it, then you have the ability to add more containers, like a module or pages. And just by adding a pack page, and then you can go in to edit that page. And then what you need to know here is really to find the toolbars. Uh, so this little line here will help you add content. Um, and these are all the different things types of content you can add. Um, you know, I, I can get into activity banks later. These are the question types. Once you have uh, content, like I have a paragraph here, and this, you want to find this other toolbar. This other toolbar allows you to do things like formatting, um, but also adding um, things like terms and citations. Uh, this button allows you to control headings or add a list. There's table, there's images, and then there's all of these other things that you can add to a course. So the really important orientation is finding the toolbar and then, you know, adding that content. So if I want to add a question, I'll just add a multiple choice question. It gives you a um, template for that. So the most important thing you want to know is you want your you're learning, if you add any activities or questions to a page, you want to tag them with the learning objectives here. Um, and if it's not in this list, I believe you can just even start uh, new, yeah, learning objective, and you can add it to, and it'll add it to that other area as well. And then you'll be able to tag it to, to more um, activities. Um, We'll get into publishing and uh, insights. So by the way, as you deliver a course from Taurus, it uh, automatically builds, pulls in any data from use into this page. So this is all of the, the students who have ever interacted with this material as it was published. And it's really giving me some metrics on, um, on each question in the course. So another thing you really want to know before you start building anything is name your uh, your questions. So uh, let me get into that. So I'll show you where to do that because that'll help when you're looking at the data. Um, so see where it says multiple choice. Multiple choice is where how it's going to show up in that data list. So if you really want to know which multiple choice, I would do something like multiple choice, um, maybe some, some taxonomy around the LO or skill, and then you know maybe a number. You're going to need to have multiple questions against that LO. Um, so you know think of a naming convention for your course as well. Uh, and I'm going to look at the um, chat and please come on you know speak if you have any questions or anything I need to address at the moment uh the link for the office hours um okay cool thanks Allison for answering that I also think I invited you all um a Senate calendar invite for these sessions and the office hours I believe um, and again, I'm sorry for such a whirlwind of information. I, I got carried away with myself in that discussion about data, I think, but I got too excited. <laughs> um, and now I lost y'all. There you are. So I hope you found this, uh, first meeting to be enlightening.
I hope that you're excited for this whole fellowship. And um, I know I am. So thank you all for, for joining us today. And if you have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to us in all the ways that are available to you and um, come to office hours too. We'd love to chat. So any burning issues or questions, I'll stay on. When I don't see Dr. that there Stone was a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was just wanted to ask when you author something in the Taurus and deliver it, does it just stay in your course? It doesn't go like out where other people can find it. What you do when you, you have to publish it and then you're given a link that then you can share with whoever you want. It's not just like. Okay. So it's somewhat. Um, it's yeah. It's, private. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, Thanks. students can access that course as a guest, so they don't need to like sign up for our account. There's the yeah. There's a couple different ways students can access it, but if you look on that overview page, you can manage who sees your course. So on that overview page, when you first build the project, there's like a visibility section, and you can just make it visible to yourself, um, and that will prevent it from being available openly and publicly. Did someone have another question? I have a question. Yes. So this authoring tool is just open and free? It is. It's open and free. Like that's kind of amazing. It is. <laughs> um, so we have a whole model for when you go to deliver it, like what, you know, we, we ask thing, you know, we have to keep the lights on. So we do when we publish courses in an academic setting, we usually charge a per student fee. Mm, okay. um, but we really, we want, we're the open learning initiative. We really mm -hmm. are just trying to get good content out there. And so uh, we can always negotiate uh, what, what payment means and how much to charge and all that. We're just, we're nonprofit. So we're just mm -hmm. looking to, you know, help support anyone doing this kind of work. Any other questions? So um, I saw Angela's comment on the chat about not getting access to Canvas. Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna work with her. Uh, I added her to the Canvas shell, but I think maybe the administrator had to do it. Um, so I'm gonna contact the administrator who who helped set this up for us. Do you want me to hang around now, or do you want to just get back to me? I'm going to have to get back to you because I'm going to, I'm going to email that administrator. They've been really quick to answer me, but I'll include you in the email so that you know the answer as well. And you'll know okay. what we're doing. And, and I also didn't get any of the calendar invitations or huh. any of that. That's um, interesting. I got the big mass email that was sent out on 920 and one from like a secretary early in doing it, or maybe a ministry of assistant of some sort but I haven't gotten any of the other things that you guys are discussing. Okay. okay. Thank you I, for leaving that. Yeah. I uh, haven't either. Um, okay. But I also was, I got taken off the wait list. Uh, same here. Same here, Kristen. Yeah. yeah so I don't See, know. I'm thinking that I thought I could just add you given that I now the, you know, owner of that canvas site, but I'm thinking the administrator might've needed to do it uh, for me. So I'll include I, you as well. I have access to the Canvas site, so that oh. I have, but I don't. I didn't get any like um, like Zoom, like any sort of calendar invites or anything like that. Okay, great. And Angela didn't get Canvas or calendar. Um, I just posted the calendar link. If you want to just click on that and integrate it within your calendar, um, that might be helpful. But then I think Erin can also. Add you to the calendar at a later time. Yeah, that might have just been my mistake. I might have not. I might have made sure that you got access to Canvas, but didn't go back to that calendar invite yet. So I appreciate you guys mentioning that. Thanks. Sure. And then Angela, I also like uh, I'll try to resend it from the Canvas the invitation. I already did that right before this meeting, and she didn't get it either. Okay. So yeah, I Thanks, think then we'll have to. Yeah. 
I think then we'll just have to reach out to the coordinator for Canvas and uh, try to present that one out. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, and I just double checked. It's not there. It's not my spam either. Okay, we'll get that straightened out for you. Um, right after I jump off this call, I'm going to write them and uh, and add you guys to the calendar invite and see if I can get that out to you as well. Okay, folks. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's session and that you enjoy the discussions and the work to come. Really looking forward to all the stuff, the great stuff you're going to build. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay, is it just us now? Maybe we can stop the recording. Yeah. Good idea.